Question number 31. We have been given a very simple circuit which has one ammeter, a lamp, there's a resistor over here which I have represented using the correct resistor symbol, uh, a zigzag line and then we have a switch over here and also we have a battery over here. Now when the switch is open we have been told that ammeter reading is 2.4 amperes but when the switch is closed we have been told that the ampere reading is 4.0 amperes. We can immediately see that when the switch is open current is only flowing in this circuit over here. We can kind of cover up this circuit to understand what is happening. So we know very well that we have a a current of 2.4 amperes always flowing through the lamp whether the switch is open or it's closed. So this is 2.4 amperes. Then we get to know that when the switch is closed there is a total current of 4.0 amperes flowing through this ammeter over here. So basically when the switch is closed we have a current of 4.0 ampere traveling over here. According to the laws of electronics and circuits we know very well that in a junction current will get divided. So in comes 4.0 out goes 2.4 over here and therefore we should get a current of 1.6 amperes over here. And that's what the question, are, question asks what is the current through this resistor when the switch is closed and when the switch will actually be closed like this I'm sorry for this line over here when the switch will be closed we will have 1.6 amperes through this circuit so our answer is option B question number 32 we have been given a diagram I have flipped the diagram I have rotated it. We have been given a diagram where we have a potentiometer over here. We have a potential divider circuit. And we are asked that as we move this terminal point T from R to S, what will be the reading on this voltmeter? Okay, let's think about how a potentiometer works. So basically how a volt voltmeter works is that it tells the potential difference between two points so currently between this point over here which is connected to this uh, terminal directly versus this point over here which is T so currently if T was at R we should get a value 0 because there is no potential difference between this point and R the wire you see over here well that has zero resistance and we only get a potential difference when there is a resistance so what a potentiometer does is that there is a resistive material over here in between R and S and because there is a resistive material as you go through this resistive material say you travel 2 twelfth of the distance okay you travel, travel 2 twelfth of the distance so that is 1 sixth let's say it's here where T is right now then we will get 2 volts of reading on this voltmeter the reason is because that point will be at 2 volts pos positive potential compared to this point over here. That is how potentiometer works. So technically if we think if we think think through that philosophy then we will understand that over here the voltage uh, read on the voltmeter is 0. Over here it's 12 because we have covered all of the resistive substance and 12 is the max voltage there is to offer by the battery so we will go from 0 to 12 volts and choosing from the options I think our answer should be B question number 33 the diagram shows a simple circuit used to make a light detector so we are talking about a light detector so it is very obvious that we'll be using some kind of photoresistor or an LDR okay one component is connected between X and Y I'll draw how the circuit looks. We have these two points over here X and Y and we have to connect one component in between them such that the ammeter reading increases when the light gets brighter. Okay, 
So maybe we have a light over here in air and shining down and as the light intensity increases we need to increase the reading on this ammeter. We directly know that we should be using a photoresistor because that, that's what a photoresistor does. It, it decreases its resistance according to the light's intensity shown on it. So as the light will increase it will decrease its resistance and as it decreases its resistance we will get a higher reading over here in the ammeter. According to that A is our answer because that is the symbol for a photoresistor. It looks like this. B is the symbol for a resistor so B is wrong. C is a symbol for a fuse so it is also wrong. D is actually a thermistor I think so it is also wrong. Question number 34. We have been given a truth table for a logic gate. Let's recall what logic gates we have. We have one of the AND gates such that if both the inputs are correct we will get a true value. We have a NOT gate. We have an OR gate. In the options we also have a NOR gate which is thus the opposite of OR. It will just reverse the outputs by OR. Okay so <clears throat> let's think about what the truth table says. So in the first row we have input 1 and input 2 as 0 and that gives us an output of 0. AND is a probability here. We can consider AND over here because it is similar to AND's logic gate at star A. NOR we cannot consider because if we had NOR it should rather have been a 1. So this is wrong. NOT actually only one output input is required for not so this is also wrong or we can consider because or has the has the same first row okay let's think about the second row 0 1 and 1 so we immediately know that our answer is d which is or gate because in and gate this would be a false value so a is also cut and our answer is d question number 35 in which device is a split ring commutator used and what is its purpose? So one thing to remember is that a split, split ring commutator is used in a DC motor. So already A and B are eliminated. So from C and D we have to choose what is the purpose of a split ring, ring commutator. I'll show you a diagram. This diagram is in the book, in my book and we have a split ring commutator over here. What this does is that as we have current over here flowing over here if the current stays in this orientation this shaft will just rotate back and forth like this it will go over here then it will come back like this it will perpetually go on so to remove that issue we have a split ring commutator what happens is as soon as this ring is turned it changes the orientation of current so that current in goes from this side and current out goes from this side and as that happens the force on this ring changes its direction and it goes on like this in this direction so split ring commutator is basically used to change the direction of the current so in turn we have an opposite force on the main shaft therefore I think option C is correct option D is clearly wrong because it says that a split ring commutator changes the input current from AC to DC which is absolutely wrong. You always use a DC current for a DC motor. So C is correct. Question number 36. What is the purpose of a relay? This is a very straightforward question and you'll just have to remember what a relay does. So a relay is basically an electri electrical device. Uh, it is sort of a switch and it is used to control a large current. So basically what happens is you provide a small current to a relay to convert it into a switch. So when you provide a small current, it allows a larger current to pass through. It is something similar to a transistor. A transistor does the same thing. Now this is a good rabbit hole. I think you should explore it. You should go down it and search up what, transistor, what a transistor is. We literally have millions of transistors in a single laptop. So that's something worth going down the rabbit hole for. So our op the correct option is D because a relay is 
used to drive a larger current using a very small current. It has some electromagnetic parts and they attach which allows the current to pass. Question number 37. When a source of alpha particles is directed towards a thin metal foil, then they become scattered. Okay, so what is an alpha particle? An alpha particle is basically the nucleus of a helium atom. So uh, we have a small nucleus and it has two protons and two neutrons. Okay, so that's an alpha particle. Now that alpha particle, a lot of alpha particles are directed towards a thin metal foil. So it is obvious that the metal will also have a lot of atoms and there will be a lot of nuclei and they become scattered which observation of this experiment provides evidence for a small charged nucleus okay so i guess we need to work through the options for this one we, we have been asked that which of these observations will prove that we have small and charged nucleuses sorry nuclei in metal foil okay option a says a small portion of the alpha particles comes straight back this seems like a very promising option because I think that is what should exactly happen. A very small portion should directly come back. Like uh, if I have an alpha particle going over here and I have a very small nucleus over here, a very small portion and there is a nucleus over here, then the al alpha particle will go and it will directly come back. It will rebound. It will be reflected. So I think this should be the option. Because a very small portion will do this, others will maybe be deflected like this or they may pass through like this but only a very small portion will be reflected back. So A seems like a promising option. B says a small portion of the alpha particles pass straight through the foil. Now this is not something which proves that there is a very small nucleus because a lot of particles will go through directly because there is so much free space. So this is clearly wrong. Some of the alpha particles are deflected by an angle less than 90 degrees. Again, we don't care about the angle. Secondly, less than 90 degrees basically means is that they go like this and maybe bend through. Which yes, it does prove that there is a nucleus, a very charged nucleus, but it does not prove that it is a very, in a very small area. So this is also wrong. Option D says some of the alpha particles follow a curved path after leaving the foil. Now this is something which I feel like isn't even true. Because I don't see any reason why alpha particles would follow a curved path apart from gravity. So we don't even care about this option. This is irrelevant. So I think option A is the correct one. Question number 38. Which description of a neutral atom of copper is correct? I feel like we again have to work through all of the options. Option A says a nucleus surrounded by electrons. This is exactly what a neutral copper atom is. We will have a lot of electrons and we will have a nucleus in the center. So this seems like a promising option. Let's explore the other ones. A nucleus surrounded by molecules. I don't think that's how it works. Like obviously we won't have molecules surrounding a, a nucleus because it is just one new, neutral atom of copper. So this is wrong. C says electrons surrounded by a nucleus. No, we know very well that a nu the nucleus is at the center. So this is wrong. Option D says electrons surrounded by molecules. Again, we are only talking about one neutral atom. And secondly, copper exists as atoms. It is not biatomic or something. So I don't think there should be molecules in our answer. We just need to care about a nucleus and electrons around it because this is how I think a copper, neutral copper atom should look. There may be shells over here. This is a nucleus. I'll represent it using a big capital N. There may be shells over here. We will have electrons like this and this is how a neutral copper atom will look 
8 over here and so on you get the idea there will be more shells so i think a is our answer question number 39 a sample of radioactive isotopes is decaying the nuclei of which atoms will decay first okay i think this is a trick question because uh, we know very well that the process is very random we know that very well it is always very random radioactivity is a very random process so let's think through the option anyways option a says it is impossible to know because radioactive decay is random see exactly what i was talking about i immediately know that option a should be right though we will explore all the other options option b says it is impossible to know unless the age of the material is known i don't think we care about the age of the material like yes the age of the material may help us in determining the half life but i don't think we care about the age of the material for determining which nuclei will decay first so b is wrong for sure option c says the atoms near the center will decay first because they're surrounded by more atoms no i don't think so we have always learned that it is very random so this is also wrong we don't care about them being surrounded or not option d says the atoms near the surface will decay first because the radiation can escape more easily well the atoms don't care if the radiation can escape more easily or not they will just decay and the process will again be very random know this one thing that radioactive decay is always random like no matter what happens so option a i think should be correct maybe in future we'll have some technology such that we can point out which atom should decay but right now no question number 40 a student determines the half life of a radio isotope the student uses a detector over 5 minutes and plots a graph showing how the count rate on the detector varies with time the count rate due to background radiation is 30 counts per minute okay so we have a background radiation of 30 counts per minute this is crucial information over here because we know very well for finding the half life the process is to subtract this count over here and if you want to know the exact reason well it is because we don't care about this like uh, we will we will notice this count every time throughout the day if we are practicing uh, an experiment in the same lab so that count does not matter okay if you need a better explanation you can maybe check out the video in the description i think the video should be a minute long and it will be worth it okay so first thinking through the question the first thing i'll do is i'll sub subtract 30 from the count rate at 0 minutes so i get a count rate of 200 200 counts after subtracting that was 230 minus 30 so i got 200 counts now to determine the half life i think i need to check when i reach half of this so that will be a 200 divided by 2 which gives me 100 counts per second sorry a minute now after we have done this now we need to add this 30 counts per minute like because uh, when we look at the graph the graph shows us the values with this 30 counts per minute added so we need to add it back to 100 to get the real count the real count that is being showcased on the device we are using to measure the count rate so once we add 30 to this value we get 130 counts per second once we get 130 counts per minute we can just check on the graph what value for x or what value for time we get so for 130 we have 1.2 minutes and looking through the options i think the option that is correct should be b 1.2 minutes